Gaddis, and uh, today is June 13th, 2016, and today we're interviewing Bruce McClendon here at his home in uh, Corpus Christi. So, so why don't we start at the very beginning and tell me when and where you were born. Uh, Brownwood, Texas. Uh, what, in, what led your parents to be there that you were in Brownsville, Texas? Uh, in, in Brownwood. My dad, Brownwood, uh, okay. Brownwood close enough. Um, hey, my grandparents lived there. My dad worked for the, my granddad worked at the railroad, was a mailman on the boxcar, and so, uh, so started there. My dad then got to the Air Force, and we traveled all over the country and uh, saw the world, spent a number of years in Japan, and then, uh, then my second dad came along, my stepdad, and he actually was a planner, and um, had worked in a lot of places like San Antonio and um, uh, Chicago. And I lived in Chicago with him there and worked in the planning department as an intern. Well, so where did you end up going to high school? High school in, uh, in Chicago there, three years in Chicago, Oak Park and River Forest and Evanston Township High School. And then, as I said, worked in, in the planning department there. Part, you know, was a little uh, picking up. Learn and what a great place to learn about planning. Uh, there, is, there is no better mecca for planning than the city of Chicago and its history. Well, I would normally ask how you got interested in planning, but I... Assume it was from your father. You got it. It was my stepdad, okay. where I get, came from. Yeah. Okay. So after high school, went straight to college. Went to uh, college uh, at the University of Missouri, at Kansas City, and the uh, first job was at HNTB, Howard Needles Tayman and Bergendorf. I, I, my degree was in business administration, and I was an economic planner for Howard Needles. And uh, they, good news of the benefit of working for a large consulting firm is they give you the opportunity to work in a lot of different areas, different kinds of activities. And so it bled over and I started doing some planning work and uh, ordinances and things of that nature and got to travel, meet people and uh, kind of become part of a network. And, and uh, then, it, then I moved into working for cities and counties and, and I basically spent the rest of my 40 some odd years working directly for local governments. Okay. Any people at HNTV that you... Uh, Dr. Wolfgang Rosler okay. was my first boss. A, an incredible person. What, uh, what a guy. And of course Texas knows him from what he did at Texas A&M University and he, he ran that department for a number of years here. Uh, but uh, 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 I thought he was a great person and uh, really a, a leader in the planning profession. A very knowledgeable and I owed a lot to him. He gave me a lot of opportunities. He had, he trusted me. I was a young kid, and um, and uh, I, I tried to return the favor to him. So, did you continue working? At what point in time did you go back for your masters? Uh, I worked in the, for about five or six years in local governments in uh, places like uh, Lawrence, Kansas, and Butte, Montana. Uh, Ron Short who was the planning director of Lawrence, uh, he convinced me that I needed to get a, a graduate degree in planning. He said, there, uh, just, there's just, you know a lot about planning, but there's a lot you don't know and about the, the theory. You, you're pretty good in the practice, but you, could, that, you should look at getting that kind of fundamental foundation that you need for, for what you actually do as a planner. And he'd gone to the University of Oklahoma and, he, and I checked into it and I became convinced that that was the kind of program I wanted to be involved in. They were for, uh, aimed at practitioner with giving you the theory and the fundamentals. And I, I would say if I had to give a kind of a career path, what did they expect you to do? They were training you to be a planning director in a small or medium sized city. And they taught you every aspect of what local government was at those small and medium sized city levels. So it was a perfect program for me, and so I went to um, University of Oklahoma for the two years, and then I came straight here to Corpus Christi. Okay, well, let's move to Okay, fast. all right. Well, who were some of the faculty members at OU that you... Oh, Jay Lee Rogers was the head of the program there, incredible uh, uh, person. Um, what, a, what an extraordinary individual. He's good news I'm, from my perspective. He's still alive today. An awful lot of the people that I knew years ago and that mentored me or you know not here anymore but uh, Jay Lee Rogers was uh, the head of that program and ran that program and was uh, outs what a what an incredible human being and terrific planner probably he had as much influence and impact on planning in this country as anybody through those students that large number of students he produced for many years because he produced solid planning professionals well, speaking of students any classmates that you keep up with or? classmates 
probably the, the classmates, uh, everybody that you were ever in, that ever went to OU as a classmate to, to the Oklahoma, to, to OU people, the Jim Duncans, the Norman Sanifers, uh, I knew those people when I was young. They were a lot, they were a couple of years, six, seven years older than I was, and they treated me like an equal. They treated me like I was a long lost friend, that I knew more than I actually knew. Um, so um, they, they were, and I've kept in touch with them over the years, and uh, they're all, they've had successful careers, and they're, they're very competent planners. So you mentioned your first job was here in Corpus? Here in Corpus Christi. I was a senior planner here. Okay. Got Do you to, remember some of the projects you Oh, sure. About? I got to, They hired me to, re, to rewrite the zoning ordinance for them, okay. and, uh, which I was able to do. I was here about almost four years, and then halfway through, through my four years, I, I, I got to take on additional responsibility and, and, and take over the preparation of the comprehensive plan here. So we did the plan uh, probably, was that uh, 77, 78? updated their old plan. This was a, what's called a, Comprehe a 701 Comprehensive Planning Assistance Grant Program for developing a land use plan. And the planning director at the time? The planning director, the guy I worked for was Larry Winger. Ernest Brionis was the director. Marvin Springer had been the director. What, uh, what an incredible g guy that was. It was terrific you know, reading what he had done and looking at records we had on files. What, what a what a sharp guy. Um, so, uh, but Larry Winger was really, for my intents and purposes, was the planning director. He, he was uh, like the assistant, but he really ran the show here and and was um, uh, was a very effective uh, planning director. And so, how long did you stay at Corpus? Four years. Okay, and then from there you went. Oh well, but far back up, okay. I went, cause, because I went to see the Hooks play last night, and we went and I went through the park down there where we have the historic properties. Mm -hmm. We actually did is one of the elements of the uh, old old 701 plan. We did a landmark preservation plan, and then 1978, 79. That was pretty far. That was pretty much in advance. Um, and uh, the theory we had two choices: we you could you could preserve in place, uh, or you can try to create a historic district. And in place was very difficult here in, in Corpus Christi because we had uh, scattered. The, the, the storms over the years had been so devastating. There were just fragments and remnants of historical properties. So the theory that we bought into and the community bought into was let's collect those homes and let's move them to a safe area down on the, uh, where we can aggregate them and create our own inauthentic but true uh, historic, uh, historical district with historical homes. So last night when I drove through there looking at those, I thought, you know, it's nice when you see a project actually come to fruition, that it worked. And, uh, and we were able to do something to save those homes. And, and um, I'm not convinced they would have survived on their own freestanding. They wouldn't have had the respect and the care and the attention that the city's been able to give them by moving them into the district. So anyway, I just had to mention that because of the... So after the, Corpus, you went to... Went, went to Galveston. Okay. And became the planning director. My lifelong dream. I wanted to be the planning director and have my own island. And so at a relatively young age, I fulfilled my dream. I got to be that, that planning director I wanted. How old uh, were you? I'm sorry. How old were you? How old was I then? Oh, good grief. Uh, I have to cook. It was 1979 from 46. So you subtract the <laughs> difference. Was that 28, maybe something like that? Don't hold me to the math on that. My, my wife's the mathematician in the family. Um, so it was a great opportunity for me. We, we did um, a Dune and Beach Preservation Plan. That was the thing I was most proud of. Um, that takes some of that environmental expertise that we picked up, that I picked up at the University of Oklahoma. There's a good example of something I learned. I, I in my practice over the years, uh, I could do zoning. I knew how to do plans, but the, the, the environmental aspect of it, the environmental suitability of properties and the, characteristics that you want to preserve and build on and what's buildable and what's should be preserved. Um, I was able to apply that to Galveston in a real life application using that just McCartian analysis, all those various overlays. And almost every place I've been, I've been able to, to do that and put that environmental foundation for the plan. Um, also did some fiscal things there, capital improvements, programming, and um, one of the key things that happened to us in 
Galveston was that we had a charter amendment that reduced, put restrictions on tax rates and valuations and we had about a 40 percent reduction that was required across the board in all government products and services and everything that we did. And there were no loopholes. Uh, there was no way to fudge it. So we had to learn how to classic do more with less. And that was uh, probably those two years had more of an impact and influence on my career than any place I ever was because I learned the hard truth and reality is that you can do more with less. That we really are wasteful and ineffective in so many areas in local government, not just in uh, public works or utilities or uh, uh, other departments, animal services, you name it, but in effect in the planning department as well. So basically I learned for the first time to start looking at what people wanted from local government. What did they want, need, value, and what were they willing to pay for? And that was a key point to me because I wanted that the public to feel like they were getting a return on their tax dollars and that government was there for them in providing the services that they wanted. I worked for a great city manager, Tom Muhlenbeck in Galveston. Tom told everybody that here's what we're going to do. We're going to cut the services that are least visible, least beneficial, least impactful in the community and we're going to preserve those services that are most important. In other words, he did the flip-flop of what they like to do in Washington or in some other jurisdictions where they say, hey, you find the programs that people really want and value, those are the ones we'll cut. So we'll let them know they're going to be hurt if they reduce their taxes or if we're not allowed to increase our taxes. But Tom was great. He said, we're not playing that game. We're going to do what we have to do uh, and make it work. And we did. And the crazy thing is, uh, uh, we were better at it. We had fewer people. Every department had fewer people and fewer resources, but there was no question in my mind we were doing a better job when we finished than when we started. And when I moved from there to Beaumont and Fort Worth, and I'm jumping ahead, and, or, but every place I was ever worked after that, it I could go in and look at a program and apply the same principles that we learned in Galveston. And it helped my career because most city managers and most uh, elected bodies are interested in getting more bang for the dollar. And so when you come in and do a job interview and you say, hey, I'm going to be able to get more production, more product, more efficiencies out of your department, and you're not going to have to pay me any money to do that. You're not going to have to pay me extra money. If I need mo more money to do something, I'm going to take money from something else that you should have quit doing 10 years ago or 20 years ago, and I'm going to free up those resources and apply them in areas that these new emerging opportunities that, for services that people actually want and are willing to pay for. And when you do an interview like that, they're going to oh my gosh, that's exactly what we want. This is what government ought to, ought to be all about. This is great. You remember any of the staff people at uh, Galveston, other than Tom? Uh, Ray Quay. Okay. Ray Quay was a uh, young, young planner I hired uh, out of school at the University of Texas who was uh, extraordinary. Boy, what a gifted, uh, smart guy that is. And Ray's uh, in Phoenix now, and it was the, uh, I guess his highest position in government was the assistant director of planning at, uh, at, at the city of Phoenix. So that was a good choice on my part. I've, I've got a couple of good people over the years that I hired out of school that have turned out to be extraordinary, uh, capable individuals. Ray was a good example of that. So you said you left Galveston after two years. Two years. Well, why did you leave? I went to, to Beaumont. My wife wanted to go. My, I think I must have been close to 30 at that point. And my wife wanted to go to school. We had just been va vagabonds enjoying ourselves. And, and uh, my wife wanted to, to, um, to go to school and get a degree and have a career of her own. And so we went to Beaumont when the opportunity presented itself. And the Lamar University was there. And, and so she got her, uh, her bachelor's degree in physics and, and, uh, and her master's in math, which is pretty good for, for somebody who, um, you know, had, who really hadn't applied herself for a lot of years, just enjoyed herself. And then to be able to gear up and go back to school after seven or eight years in uh, some very uh, tough, challenging fields. So she's a happy camper. She still to this day loves uh, Beaumont and, La and, La and Lamar. 
Well, tell me about your work in Beaumont. Beaumont was great. That was the, I always liked the, the, the cities that needed fundamentals, and Beaumont needed fundamentals. They had 30, 40 year old zoning ordinance, antiquated subdivision regulations, no plan. Um, if they did, it was you know a 50s plan kind of a thing. So I got to do it all. It was great. Uh, we, we updated the zoning regulations and simultaneously with the comp plan, so we were able to integrate the regulations, the kind of the principles in the plan into the regulations. Um, had a super planning commission work, worked with. Uh, we had a separate planning and, and a zoning commission. And so we got this, I was able to spend a lot of time with, uh, with the planning commission uh, doing continuing education, turning them into planners so that the community would have its own planners and not have to depend on a vagabond planner like myself. Um, so that was, that was great, I mean, to be able to to do kind of run the whole table on that and produce all those fundamental uh, solid documents that you need to be able to to plan and manage a city and at the same time my wife was able to complete her education so that worked great well same question other staff members uh, uh oh my gosh uh this is terrible i may have to come back on this and that's okay i should have i should have written this down oh my gosh what am, uh this this is embarrassing um, I'll think of it before the interview is up here. But uh, I, I basically, they gave me an opportunity to hire th hire uh, some uh, young planners because we, they were going to staff up the department and let us do these things. And I've always done things in house. I, I've, I've not used consultants. Um, I just kind of take the fun out of it, and I like the idea of of, of doing it ourselves. Um, but the city manager. Um, said we have a, 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 a racial problem in Beaumont. We have a kind of a history here that's not good with respect to the African-American community. We have about 40%, high 30% of black uh, uh, residents in the community and they're really not represented in government. So he said, I want you to, to basically integrate the planning department. I've got to have minorities in the department. And I said, no problem. But I said, here's what you're gonna have to do for me. You're gonna have to give me the money. And to, so when I finished telling you it wasn't gonna cost you anything, now I'm telling him, hey, it's gonna cost you. Because I gotta pay to get a, a quality minority people. It's important to me that we, if we bring minorities in here, we want them to knock the socks off everybody they run into and meet. We want people to understand, wow, were we stupid? Were we idiots? So as I said, it's real important that we get the, the best qualified people we can. And so the first person I hired was a young woman at the Texas Southern University, Cheryl Cockrell. And uh, I hired Cheryl and Cheryl, after I left in a number of years, eventually became the planning director. So I felt great because I think quite possibly she is the, I know she's the first black planning director in the state of Texas. She may be the first woman at that point because that was in the early 80s. Um, but she also then went on to become the planning director of Dallas a number of years. So that's a, a second time I was able to hire somebody that I was, I was pretty excited about. Um, but I, we hired um, Hispanic from Texas A&M University, Jesse Torres. And uh, Jesse was, is a, was a super guy. Uh, and uh, I ended up hiring him again, as I did Cheryl, by the way, too, in other, in other places I've worked. I was able to hire Jesse in uh, in Fort Worth, um, and uh, he was uh, another just outstanding super guy. But hey, they were super kids coming out of schools, and uh, we gave them a good opportunity, a lot of authority, a lot of responsibility, um, a lot of opportunities for them to to grow themselves, and uh, they all and they did. So I, I'm hard pressed to find bad hires over the years. Uh, I've, I've found uh, that. And if you just start with good people and get a, kind of get out of their way, uh, it's amazing what they can do. So how long were you in Beaumont? I was in Beaumont about four years. Okay. And again, why did you leave? I, I'm finished. I mean, the job was done. It was like this city manager here that resigned not too long ago. He basically done what he could do. I mean, for the, I could not understand. After we had our updated plan and our capital improvements program and our zoning ordinances and our subdivision regulations and our planning commission was up and running and they were, you know, pressuring me. They were, they, they were learning so much. We were in a constant 
positive relationship about who could come up with better ideas and for the community. So uh, after four years, man, there was the table with the cabinet was bare. The cabinet. Um, so I so I went to Arlington, where the uh, consultant had uh, had interviewed me. Was uh, recruiting. The, the nice thing um, about some of that early work that I did, and then through APA, I quit having to apply for jobs. I, it's probably been 25 years since I applied for a job, because at some point you get a reputation, and that the job starts seeking you and coming to you, and you get to kind of pick and, and choose what you want to do. And so a consultant approached me about the, the Arlington situation and said, boy, they're rapid growth, uh, basically, uh, you know, whispering uncontrolled, um, regulations lax, a um, lot of unrest in the citizens because of the pace, the rate of growth, and they weren't weren't really accommodating it well enough. They were getting changes in the community that people didn't like in terms of livability and the school crowding and roads and etc. So, so I went to to Arlington. You remember what year? Uh, yes, I do. That would have been maybe 80, 85, maybe okay. something like that. Nineteen eighty five. Um, and uh, Arlington was, was um, maybe 83, but Arlington was great uh, in that it made me get out of the box because I had been doing traditional kind of cookie cutter land use plans, although we customized the policies so that they reflected. The, the one thing you can kind of recognize my plans that I put in place, but you won't recognize the content, the goals and objectives and policies because they're all customized. You know, there's nothing you take off the shelf and plug into a community. That community is, is, is its own community. It has its own character and its own sense of place. And so you, you give me a couple of years and, you, and we get an active program, you can, you, good things can kind of happen. Um, so in Arlington, the, the development community was very powerful and it was their view that the community was growing so rapidly they could not, um, you couldn't plan for the future. The, the, it was so violent and so disruptive and so uncertain that it's impossible to do a plan and kind of anticipate where we're going to go. Uh, and so that was tough. I mean, here I am trying to, because in a sense they're right. It, cl clearly that was unlike any community in, elsewhere in the country at that point. But Ray Quay, who was uh, talked about in uh, Galveston, I, I hired him in Arlington and we said, Ray, let's, let's do this let's do something different. And Ray came up with an, uh, the concept of scenario planning, and which is a big thing to him even to this day. I think 25 years later, he's still pushing scenario planning. But it's a concept we picked up from Shell Oil, where and it, it would take too long to explain what Shell's approach to this was. But it was basically that since they didn't know what oil prices were gonna, well, they didn't know about all these political uncertainties, et cetera, they developed a, a series of scenarios and they developed basically policies and proposals for each scenario. So we said, why don't we do the same thing in Arlington? Let's come up with three scenarios, not high growth, low growth, mid growth, but three different physical forms of development that could be applied here in the community. And let's develop basically three different kinds of plans. Let's put them into a table and here they are. And if, it's, if it turns out as the community evolves forward and the uh, residents start wanting to lead in one direction with the elected officials, et cetera, that we have a, a plan in place for them. So that as conditions change, opportunities change, they have the ability to slide back and forth. Um, and so we developed what, was, what we call a strategic comprehensive plan. And we actually got, besides it getting adopted, we actually got a national award, uh, Innovation and Planning Award from the American Planning Association. So. That was positive for me. It got us out of a box, got us something new. The plan's in place. And the same token at that point, uh, uh, it had been two years, and it had been a contentious two years. I would say that was the, by far the, uh, my most challenging job because of the reluctance of the development community to buy into planning. I mean, they really were fearful and distrustful. And, and so we, we, but we were able to craft something that gave them enough peace of mind that, that they were willing to try it, so to speak. Um, but when we finished that plan, at that point, James Toll, who was the planning director in Fort Worth, 
had called me and James was like what we were doing, how I was doing it. He said, I'd like to, to talk to the city manager about you and you becoming, considering becoming the planning director of Fort Worth. So, so basically James Toll recruited me then and came over to the city of Fort Worth. Well, before we leave Arlington, okay. and we, uh, you talked about Ray, but any other staff people that were? Ro Rose Jacobson okay. was the uh, assistant, my assistant director. Um, and, and she ended up taking your job? She you took my job. She, yeah. she did. And that's one of the nice things about wherever I've been, my assistant director became my director. And I always felt that that was one reflective of my developing them uh, and putting them at that point. But two, I felt like if you're doing your job properly and you leave, they're going to want somebody to, uh, I guess it's like the president wanting somebody to follow him that wants to do what he's doing. So to the degree they, they brought in this, they, made, they continued the path I started us on. I always felt like that was an affirmation that I was on the right path, that I'd done the right thing. And uh, so I was real pleased that when I left, my assistants became the, the planning director. Okay. You remember who the city manager was in Arlington when you were there? Oh my, oh yes, Bill Kershoff. Okay. Oh boy, what a, what a, incre there's a, I've worked for some of the best city managers in the history of the profession. Bill Kirchhoff was what Milan Beck I mentioned earlier was. Bill Kirchhoff was incredible. Um, he was a former military guy, and I, re I remember when he became our city manager, the, somebody, I, I talked to somebody who worked for him in, in Lakeland, I think it was Lakeland, Colorado, who I'd known, an OU grad kind of guy, and, and I said, what can you tell me about him? And he said, he is the worst, use a B word here, B-A-S-T kind of guy you are ever going to see. He's He's militaristic. You might as well have a crop and be hitting your head. He's he's brutal. He's demanding. He's he says, and you, McClendon, are going to love him <laughs> because he and he was right. That is the I like being ridden hard, and and I like being pushed, and I like having the excuses to to push for change, to go forward and do it, you know, with a sense of urgency. So he so he was a super guy to work for. And in all honesty, if if it hadn't been him. I probably would not have survived that job in Arlington with the development community. They had enough political clout there that I would have been hard pressed to keep my job. But he was such a strong, powerful force of, and an ethics, an ethical city manager that, boy, he was going to, as long as he was a city manager, I was going to be the planning director. So that felt great. Ray, by the way, Ray Riley was the city manager in Beaumont when I was there. And, and a lot of these guys are KUs. The one thing I've noticed that in the Midwest, when I when I worked there, uh, uh, the the, OU, the the KU school was, was to me was like the OU school. They really taught city managers how to manage cities. And that program was started by L. P. Cookingham at uh, at at uh, KU, and L. P. Cookingham also was working for Howard Needles when I was in Needles. He was a a consultant kind of. Uh, emeritus kind of a guy and I used to get the opportunity to ride with him to go places when we were making presentations or presenting and so he would sit in the car and he would talk about city management um, and, he, and people always ask why I didn't become a city manager instead of a planning director and I will tell you th that I respect that city management profession but I was a planner I was born to be a planner um, and not to not to be a manager of, uh, of other people um, you know, I, I wanted to, to be involved in, in creating the, helping create the future of the, of the community, not running the ship there as we're, as we're sailing. Well, you may not recall, but you once told me that you were a little frustrated that city managers only had to have 36 hours of graduate school and well, that, planners had to have about that, 60. That was, that was really funny because at Lawrence, when, and I was the assistant director at Lawrence there uh, um, when, uh, uh, before I, I when I left Howard Needles, um, and that, and I used to go out and lecture at the KU at the public administration program, and and they'd bring you in and spend like a week. They were they were great about they bring practitioners in, and work with that. So I would spend about a week, you know, like three to three class periods, you know, talking about planning, which actually helped me then because it created opportunities in the future for, for jobs where I was. Uh, where these managers remembered me. Hey, I remember that guy. Let's uh, let's bring him in here. But it was a one-year program at at uh, Lawrence. And here, Ron Short is there saying, "No, you need to go to a two-year program at 
at, at the at an OU there to become a planner. So yeah, it always seemed a little unfair, but I think they've evened it up now. I think those city managers have have made the transition, and they now have two-year programs for most of their master's degrees in city management. Well, and I recall that Cookingham may have been manager in Fort Worth. Long. He, probably, yeah. a, probably, but before I was before I was there, and I'm trying to remember who the famous guy was right before I got there, but uh, who had left and uh, went to work with uh, American Airlines. I always remember the story he told us because he came back. He was at a city management program. Uh, and, and he was talking about the difference between the public and the private sectors. And so I was listening to him and he was, he said, you know, at American Airlines, he said, we have five job classifications. Five, that's it. There's five different, th everybody's one of those five things. He said, how many of you in, in government here in this room, how many of you have a single department with only five classifications, in the, in it, much less the whole organization? But that was one of his points about the private, the public sector, and the private sector that the private sector has a has a better grasp on giving people opportunities. You know, having very expansive job descriptions, a lot of responsibility, versus governments which chunk these things up and and do this. So that was one of his arguments about how to make government more efficient is is to reduce these job classifications and get to and basically eliminate middle management. Is what it came down to. Anyway, James was recruiting you to Fort Worth. Yes, he did. And so went to Fort Worth. Great, great experience there. Um, you remember what year that was? Oh, that might have been 80, 80, I think somewhere between 83 and 85 okay. um, that, uh, that I worked for Fort Worth and worked for, uh, had, a, had a super chairman of the zoning commission there, Kay Granger. And uh, she went on to become city manager, one of the uh, city manager went on to become may, mayor. One of the things that I've done is most of the time where I was at, the chairman of my planning commission went on to become the mayor. And I thought that we in the planning department had a lot to do with that. We gave that person the kind of foundation for understanding and for relationship building with the community. Um, so we were able to, you know, facilitate that find that political leadership and encourage it and promote it and and I'm incredibly proud today that Kay Granger is you know is in the in the US Congress I think that's and I think she was in that because of the kind of person she was she wanted a goals program we had had a goal goals for Dallas was out there and about when I'd been here in Corpus Christi or that I talked about earlier we had a goals program goals for Corpus Christi John Lewis who was the director of goals for Dallas came down here and ran this goals program. This was bar none at that time and any time afterwards still the best goals program in the United States. We, this was a community that had a history of, uh, of public involvement in the planning process going all the way back to the end of World War II here when they, as soon as that war was over they didn't hire a consultant. The community got together and organized and said we need a plan for growth. We, we need a plan for the future. They've always had that self-help tradition here. And John, when John Lewis came here and started that goals program, they said, how are we going to do this? This is almost a 50% minority community. Um, it's poor. Um, educational attainment. I think we were like, let me do me a favor here and touch this. This is a great interruption. <laughs> now my phone's working. <laughs> um, but we had all these impediments. I mean, in theory, if you would look at a, a place like Corpus Christi in Oasis County, you can't have meaningful citizen participation here. That's what they would tell you. But the reality of it is, John put the, together a program. We had something like 12,000 citizens that participated in this goals program. I mean, that's incredible numbers. Pre-technology, everything, writing, Hard copy ballots, we had people balloting on the future of Corpus Christi. It was, the theme of the program was issues facing Corpus Christi. And, and that's how you do future. F the, if you, don't, you don't get in a room and ask people, what do you want to see in the future? You get in a room and you ask people, what are the issues and problems that you have? And how can we solve those issues and problems? And if we solve those issues and problems, then what kind of community will you have? And when you approach public participation 
and goal setting in that fashion, you actually develop goals. You develop goals that reflect what the community wants and values, needs, and is willing to pay for. And they own those goals. They become their goals. Um, so that program, she knew about it. We said, let's do a program in, in, in Fort Worth. So we did a program, but it didn't have the history that our program has, so we used a different concept. We got out of the box and we still did a Goals for Fort Worth. And I can still to this day remember the heat that the mayor caught from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram for having a Goals program. Because believe it or not, the Star-Telegram felt that if you ask people and you involve people and they become the people's goals, that's not leadership. That's following. We want a mayor that will lead and set out those bold goals and challenge the community to achieve those goals. To achieve her goals? I mean, how nutty, how, how insane was that? And I have all the respect in the world for the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. And boy, did they, it, it, that's gotta be one of the biggest blundering editorials in the history of, of media coverage. So she was right, they were wrong. You know, when you had that janitor that came up on the stage, or a guy came up on the stage, and he, and he gave what, his, what he was looking for in the community, and he says, you know, three hours ago I was sweeping the floors here, and I'm up here now, and I'm treated with respect, and people are listening to me, and they care about what I have to say. Only in America can, can you say that. And he was an immigrant that had come in, and I think it was Eastern European or something. But that's what that goals program, you want, the mayor's thought was, we want everybody at the table. We want everybody in the community at our table. Um, and, and to help us, help us make decisions. So she was great. What a leader. So what other big projects the big, she used? I, the, the best thing I did there that I really liked was the um, comprehensive plan. The, you know, I asked people, where's the plan? And they, they pointed to the, to the file cabinets. There were just file cabinets all over the place that this is the plan. You get a plan for the water, a plan for the sewer, a plan for this. Nobody ever put all those plans together. So it'd been an e easy thing to do, put them all together, you know, give yourself a future land use plan. But what I came up with was something that had been bugging me for years with Bob Cornish had started this with me. Bob uh, was a professor at Texas A&M University and he had been in California and he was good buddies with T.J. Kent. T.J. Kent wrote the book, uh, The Urban General Plan, which is maybe the best book, at least one of the best two books in uh, America in the history on how to do general planning. And Cornish's concern and, and Kent's concern was they had come up with a concept called the Unified Summary of the Comprehensive Plan. And that was the way to take all these different elements in the plan in this big document and summarize it in a way that made sense, that showed the interrelationships relationships and the linkages. And they didn't know, they couldn't figure out how to do that. So, of course, that's the kind of challenge I like. And I said, let's do that. That's what we have here at Fort Worth, so let's make a model on how to do that. And so we developed the unified summary of the comprehensive plan. And we produced the plan as a brochure that had the, the uh, as, a, as a poster. On the front side of the poster was the land use plan showing the layout, future layout, arrangement of growth, and all the systems that we had in place. And on the back side, we had summaries of the various um, elements of the plan and the key portions that related to the physical in the front part of the plan. And then we had the, developed a little matrix thing that showed where all the cross linkages were so that if someone wanted, along with the financial costs of it, as a, as a standalone little financial instrument. But the key thing was this poster that could be put on a wall, uh, easily understood, easily grasped, and, and to, to most land use plans just have the colors, you know, the colors and the symbols, community, you know, here's a regional shopping center, here's a high school, here's the deal, here, et cetera. What we did is took, put photographs and illustrations on the borders of the plan and little arrows leading to it so that when we talked about an activity center, here was a, a little block of text in a photograph or a concept, artist concept, of what an activity center looked like. So that a, a citizen could walk up there and actually see this map, and instead of having a colored legend that says residential, commercial, industrial, or whatever it is, 
you can read this and go to these legends on the side, and you can see physically what we were talking about happening in Fort Worth in the future. Um, so we produced that plan, and then we said the key to planning is to make sure your plans don't get outdated. So we did it in a way that could be updated every two years. So as we did the various elements of the plan during the two years, we added them and to the face, the changes it made to the future land use plan, and we put the box in the back, we updated the box in the back, so you flipped it over, and folded it, opened it out, and this, you read it, well this year we updated the utility master plan, so you can see, well, power, you know, utility plant, storm, uh, the um, sewer treatment plant's gonna be here, et cetera, et cetera. When you go on the other side, you can see what was being done in the plan. So it was a way to show the, the plan was fluid, a living document. It gave you the predictability and the framework for the future, but at the same time, it gave the synopsis. One, of, one quick funny story, when I was asking our planners to consolidate, to take an element and turn it into a page of text that summarized what was in that plan, that, how it impacted the, the physical form of the community, they said, we can't do that. We need, we need a lot more pages than one page. I said, no, we're gonna, you're going to do it in a page. I remember after about six weeks, we all got together and I said, well, what did we find? And the consensus was, we didn't have one page worth of synopsis on these elements that had been done because they had been done not with the idea of linkage and integration into a plan or communication with the, with the public. It had been done as an internal document to support the department's activities. So they understood what was in there. It met their needs, but it didn't. So we basically had to revisit and extract and become planners and pull out the plans that were uh, what it really meant and what it meant to the community. Now we did a version of the same thing on the, on the neighborhood plans. And we did, neighbor, Fort Worth has always had a heritage and history of neighborhood planning. So we strengthened the neighborhood plans by going from the books, the little 50 page things that were bound, spiral bound that we used to have for neighborhood plans, we did a poster. And we did this very same thing, that here's the neighborhood, here's the changes, the photographs and how it's changed, flip it over, and here are our goals, objectives, and we were able to put a, a capital improvements program on the back showing the various physical projects that are planned for the next five years in their neighborhood and the little box showing which department was doing it, who's the individual responsible for doing it, where's the contact number to find and get information on it. So we changed those neighborhood plans into, into something that the neighborhood could understand and support. And that's the same thing in that what we learned in the Beaumont about the ownership. When those neighborhood plans now were that poster plan, a true story, I would go into a, a homes and there would, the people who'd been on the committees working on those, they had them framed on the wall. And what we always did is we had the committee sign those and everybody that participated, they signed those plans so they could see them. It was their, their kind of signed baseball of who played on that team. It was there on the wall and it was framed. And I will tell you what, the, the one kickback I got from the city council on this is because those communities owned those plans, it became like hell for the elected officials to say, you know what, we'd really rather swap off that park over there for you know the road widening over here. And everybody go, oh, don't think so, and the whatever. So it affected their flexibility a little bit, and they didn't like that. Um, and so there for a couple of years, especially after I left, that I think they reduced the, um, the, the um, effort, the, the resources to neighborhood planning, and they kind of let that decay a little bit. Uh, and, on, and the other kind of negative from it, from an elected official standpoint, a lot of the council people came from the community planning groups. So the community planning group was really a kind of a school for civics to, for public involvement, and, and, and it, was a, it was a kind of a feeding, a line to feeding into leadership. And I think the city council at some point decided, you know what, we like being council people. And we probably don't need to be so easy to be training people to come in here and become const uh, uh, contestants for our job. So I really kind of, uh, to be ugly about it, felt there was a little bit of that it, it, because the program was incredibly effective and it had this huge history and now it's even better than it was before. So why on earth would you, what would make you nervous about it? 
Fort Worth called their neighborhood plans sector plans? Uh, they, it was a target area planning program, we called it. The, um, I don't remember calling them sector plans. They were, they, were targeted, they, were, they were targeted area plans, I think. You kind of alluded to your staff, uh, who on the staff worked with you? Well, I had, uh, I had Cheryl Cockrell there again. I had Jesse Torres there. Uh, uh, Emil Monsivias. Emil was my assistant director. And when I left, Emil uh, became planning director, as I've said. And, and what I'm really proud of, too, is that a number of years later, Emil became the planning director of San Antonio. Uh, and, I mean, what a perfect fit he was uh, uh, for that position. I can't, I've, he was a little reluctant to, to interview for that job, and I said, Emil, your whole life you have been in training and planning to be the planning director of San Antonio. You've got to do that. Because he did love Fort Worth. It, hey, my, to this day, my wife that has not forgiven me for us leaving Fort Worth. <laughs> she left. She got. She was teaching at TCU, and and uh, she loved that community. Loved the people there, and we had. And it was a great place to work and live. Uh, and well, speaking of leaving Fort Worth, at one point you did. So, where did you go, and why? That, well, it, it, at that point, we the same thing. Everything was in place and running. We we're updating those plans every two years. It was a simple thing, and the neighborhood plans were working, and. And uh, I got this call, like I usually get, and they, they said, hey, we, how about um, Orange County, Florida, which was Orlando, Florida? And I kind of had a bias on counties. Uh, you know, in Texas, counties don't have, uh, I think they don't even have the, some of the, or a lot of the police powers that cities had when I was practicing here. I don't know where we are now. Um, but they didn't have zoning, for example, and that kind of thing. Uh, and so there very little need for, they thought, very little need for planning. So they said, hey, we, we, how about the county? And I go, well, gee, you know, I'm kind of a city dude. And they said, well, the counties are cities. And so that's what, what I found out in, in Florida, that, that it's not Orange County. It's Orange County City. It's the city of Orange County is what it is. Two-thirds of the people in Orange County, where Orlando is, two-thirds of the people live in the unincorporated part of the county. It's just the opposite of Texas, where you have very few percentage of people live in unincorporated parts of counties, majority live in cities. It's vice versa in, in uh, Florida. So the real power is not the city of Orlando, it's Orange County. So they, I'm getting there and I pick that up and say, hey, um, they have mandatory planning legislation, they have to do comprehensive plans, they, they have to have them updated every five years. That was one thing they liked about me. They were still trying to figure out how to do their plan to start with, and then they were going to have to update it in five years. So they were saying, this just sounds like a never-ending death spiral here. What's going on? So, uh, so they said, hey, here's the guy who has come up with this way of updating these plans. So, Remember what year you went to Orange County? It would have been in the, I think, in the early 90s, 92 maybe, something like that. So I went there, 91, 92, and um, we had the, and I, and I remember, starting a ruckus right off the bat because they were holding up their plan, what they was passing for a plan. And I made the crack. I said, well, you've got a zoning ordinance dressed up in a, tux as a tux in a tuxedo. It's not a real plan you've got here, you know, so you need a real plan. And I survived that. That was a, that blew up because there are a lot of people that had ownership of that darn thing, and which I didn't know about. i am always been a little too candid in my life. Um, but also, you kind of, when I went to the, to Orlando to interview for with Orange County. I, re, I remember my kids told me it was a little delegation of them at the doorways I'm leaving. And they were they were ranging at that point. They were probably 15 years old, down to like seven or something, and through my three sons. And they said, "Dad, if if you interview down there and you don't get the job, don't come back." <laughs> <laughs> so that's how my kids felt about this Orlando. And uh, a lot of people do. I mean, that's you like died and gone to heaven if you're a kid. You get to live in Disney World? No, no, you just next to it. It'll be cl it'll be close. So I went to Orlando and and uh, had the mandatory legislation. And I, most of my fights w in Orange County were with the state, the State Department of Community Affairs, which was providing. They had this regulatory oversight. Over, over local planning. I mean, they were really obsessed with having top-down planning, and it was top-down planning. Uh, it was going to come from the state, and the state would tell this, the county, and the county would tell the cities, and, and that's a terrible way to do planning. Uh, you know, I'm a bottoms-up guy, so I fought 
for 10 years, 11 years with a city of, uh, with the state to say, hey, here's what you've got to do. And, and, and then the 10 years that I was there, the planning that there uh, in terms of the professional accomplishments, this is, this sound, sounds, here's what's hard about talking about something like this. I've, most of the planners I met in my life over the years, when they were kids in elementary school and the kids in the classroom would voting for class president or the schoolroom president or whatever it was, the ones who didn't vote for themselves were the ones who became planners. Planners have this preconception, this notion that it, you can't vote, you shouldn't vote for yourself and that it's, you shouldn't be taking credit for things. You're, it's not you, you know, it's, you're, it's them, it's, it's other folks. And, and, and that's different than when it started. When my dad was in there and, and uh, uh, I'm trying to remember who the uh, planner of the year was in Time Magazine. Uh, uh, I'll think of it in just a second here. I will too. Uh, um, Bacon, Ed Bacon. But I mean, we went in the 1950s from a planner, a planning director of Philadelphia being the Time Magazine back then, man of the year, person of the year now, um, to we don't vote for ourselves in the classroom. So that's something we've had to deal with. If you're, if you're not, the good news is, if it is true that if you don't have to take credit for, if you, if you don't care if you get credit for something, it's amazing what you can accomplish. That is as wise a statement has ever been made. And, and I've never wanted, it was never about me when I did things. It was just the opposite. It was trying to make it effective and make it work. And the only way to do that is to get people to own it. If it's, if it's their plan, it's a, there's a chance it'll happen. If it's my plan, ain't gonna happen, not gonna happen. That Gruen plan for Fort Worth was the best thing that ever happened to Fort Worth. That downtown plan, grew, I, when I was an APA president, we gave the Gruen family an award for that plan. And I remember talking to the planners from California who were at the National Conference where Gruen's firm was located and they said, you do know, you know, they were start, told me what people thought about Gruen there, you know, that you do know this was not a accepted plan. And I said, yeah, we got it. It was a great plan in theory. But here's why it worked for Fort Worth. That plan was so out of touch. That was plan was taking concepts that had nothing to do with Fort Worth and slapping them down in the middle of Fort Worth and creating some kind of metropolis even, mag even more cosmopolitan than Dallas, right smack dab in the middle of Fort Worth. And, he, I, and I, I told the guys from California, I said, look, here's, here's what I know. That plan scared the living hell out of every person in Fort Worth that saw that plan, especially the people that were cultured people that had the money in that, in that downtown area. It so terrified them that they did their own plan and they hired their own firm and did the, and today, look at that downtown in Fort Worth. That downtown in Fort Worth looks like that today because the business community and the citizens got together and developed that plan and owned that plan and made that plan come about. That was not the Gruen plan. Well, long jump then to in Fort Worth in, um, in Orange County, the plan that we did there, I, the basic concept was based on something I picked up at the University of Oklahoma, Garden Cities of Tomorrow, 1893. We created a series of garden cities in the outlying suburbs around the city of, of uh, Orlando. Um, and they were exactly out of the textbook. Green belts surrounding them, a uh, mile in area approximately, community center, neighborhood park, elementary school, a walkable community, accessible on a link on, a, on an outer beltway so you could go from village to village to village and it's not all peanut butter and jelly spread out it's actually the separate and distinct where your sectors we call it sector planning but villages they were a series of of garden communities being created and at the same time we did a new town in town with the naval station because there was a big naval training station there that the government shut down so you want to make lemonade out of that we turned that to an urban enclave, so basically it was a new town in town. Uh, and then we did the traditional compact and contiguous form with respect to the traditional urban form, what was already there around the city. And this, this gets so complicated, but 
in, in, that you have to deal with this in, in such a short period of time. But under state law, they did not want cities to expand out. They did not want the garden cities we were talking about. They wanted the cities to gradually, systematically over time, just like silly putty, just slowly ooze out, but ooze out in a very compact and contiguous fashion, which in a lot of places, in a lot of places in Florida, that, that would work. It does not work in Orange County because you had something like 26 cities, each doing their own thing, including the bigger city of Orlando. And then we had the unincorporated county around this thing. And you're trying to, how do we integrate all this? How do we make this happen? And then you have Disney World, which is located 20 miles from downtown Orlando. And you literally have to drive 10 miles from the urban area to Disney. And you think, well, what's wrong with that? Ten, what's a 10 mile drive? Well, here's what's wrong. Disney World was the largest employer in the state of Florida. So here you are in a county with the largest employer located here, and your city's over here, and you don't have anything between the two. I mean, that's stupid. That is inefficient. That's not anti-sprawl. That's not newer. There's nothing. There is no way to put the label on what Orange County was when it was created. So I said, what we need to do is do a bellway around here. So one, you can bypass this this heavily interstate, because everything everybody was feeding off the interstates, of course, the rest of the world, including Orlando. But we do the beltways, outer loops around, so you can bypass the cities on the interstate traffic when you need to. So you can link these villages up to a way, and we with tolls, if they're gonna pay for themselves, fine. If they want them, we'll pay, they let them pay for it. Uh, and then we've got this infill where we can deal with this new urbanism so we can have walkable communities inside in the built-up area, and at the same time then practice this compact and contiguous at the edges of our sprawl pattern. So that I, that's terrible in this, be giving you this quick, quick kind of synopsis on this thing. But self-serving to me, that is as good of an example of customizing planning and taking traditional planning theories and concepts and applying them in an already built-up area. And one of the other aspects, uh, just uh, as an aside, in the, all this area around Disney World, the theory was, but the state had espoused, well, if we have all these orange groves out here, and we'll be able to, so agriculture can, so they were creating this agricultural deal. Well, the problem was the orange groves were not feasible. The climate, the gradual changes crept up in the state there, was destroying the, the ability for, the, for these growers to survive. So on one hand, you had a dead industry, a dying and almost dead industry that was using the land that had no alternative use of the property unless you could figure out a way to use these village concepts, this garden cities, and then use transfer development rights from the agricultural to the cities so that you could, to the villages, so you could create the value in here and extract some of that value and share it among the agricultural growers. So, and that was also back then, a, you know, an emerging concept, TDRs. I don't ever hear about TDRs anymore, so I don't know what's happened to that, to that concept. But it was very effective and it worked. And it was a way to transfer, create value, transfer value, and maintain those open spaces so that those communities don't grow together and they're separate, distinct, they're identifiable, they have their own unique character and culture. Um, so that, that was Orange County. And uh, well, again, staff members? People that you worked with at Stand Cheryl Cockrell again. Uh, <laughs> I was able to I was able to steal her from the city of Dallas, so I was I was happy on that. Uh, people not not people here uh, uh, that you would uh, be aware of. Nobody of, of of Texas connection in that. Although John Lewis, it's interestingly enough, we did bring John Lewis in, who was the director of Goals for Dallas, the Corpus Christi, and the Fort Worth program. He became our economic development specialist for Orange County and uh, only recently has he retired there he was he uh, he was the here's the guy who's really into citizen participation but he was such a smart guy and so well versed in economics and technology um, that uh, he was able to Orange County was a leader in Florida in terms of economic development because of John because of the things he was able to do and the, pr and the packages he put together and our, our chairman was always uh, adamant that the, the, uh, just the mayor counties, and now they were called mayors, but back then they were chairman, 
mayor said that we, we want economic development to pay for itself. We do not want to give anything. If they get anything back from us, it's only after we get something from them. And so we set programs up like that so that if, hey, sure enough, if we brought in $10 million extra in taxes, they could get their $2 million. But an awful lot of cities and counties in Florida, they'd give you the $2 million, and then they'd wait for their $10 million. And their $10 million would come sometimes, and sometimes it wouldn't. Most of the time it didn't. So we kind of, uh, John was a genius on structuring those contracts, and we had more businesses in there crying to the elected officials trying to get those agreements renegotiated. And of course, politically, you can't do that. Taxpayers don't not going to want to see you subsidize business like that. But they, they're willing on occasion to give business some of its money back after it collects it. So you were in Orange County for 10 or 11 years? 10 or 11 years. And then you moved on? Went over to, then quick here, we'll be quicker in this, to Hillsborough County. I worked there for uh, several years, three or four years, doing the same thing we were doing. Hillsborough's Tampa St. Pete. Hill, Hill, Hillsborough's Tampa St. Pete. We are doing the same thing. Same series of fights with the state, too. That's just hysterical. Uh, oh, that was the other thing. i got to back up. One last little deal on this uh, Orange County. The, we had an urban service area boundary, which I mentioned. That's a hard, that's a, should be a hard boundary, but it's a, it's a wiggly line on a map. And every week you'd have hearings and move that boundary and the state would throw a tizzy fit you can't move the boundaries and hey you're growing population what are you supposed to do you know you move the boundaries and you do it but we came up with the notion that to make those boundaries work you've got to have a physical barrier that's identifiable so then you quit get away from this business of of uh, just moving an imaginary line on a map and so there's an Econohatchee River there on the east side of, of Orlando and Orange County and we've made that as our urban service area boundary we drew our line in the sand and said, this is it. The city is not going to grow east of that. The county is not going to grow east of that. That will give us our hard containment over here, and that will create the opportunity for the growth to go in these villages, these, these garden cities that we're creating over here in this infill there. And we did that and survived that and lived to tell about it. And so really all aspects of growth management, from urban service area boundaries to urban infill to villages, garden cities tomorrow, we slapped all that in the middle of Orange County. And most people today know zero about that. I'm not even sure the planners who live there understand what all was done there. But from a textbook example, there, in the theory and the application of theory to practice, there's never been a better example. And then same thing in Tampa, Hillsboro. Worked there a couple of years. To, uh, I will say that, uh, well, we'll forget that one. Let's go on. Then, uh, then last my last job uh, working for local government was the city was Los Angeles County. So uh, I was there two and a half years. Did uh, they same thing? Thirty five year old zoning ordinance, thirty five year old comprehensive plan. We did the comprehensive plan. We did a draft of the plan, and uh, we had, we hired a consultant to do the zoning ordinance. They hired. You got to admit they hired him before I got there, folks. So, because uh, I would have loved to, loved to have updated that zoning ordinance in-house, but they spent a couple of million dollars and hired a consultant to, to update the ordinance. So we were in the process when I, when I retired from there, actually be candid, this is to uh, tell the truth, actually, I've, I've never known anybody that hadn't been fired in the planning profession, including my stepdad, you name it, we've all, at some point, I had never been fired, um, never thought I'd come very close to being fired, exception of Arlington. But I actually was fired in uh, in Los Angeles County, uh, and uh, so that was the the one blemish. I used to there's a there's an old cowboy poem out here that when I, that I heard years ago that ain't no horse that can't be rode, ain't no cowboy that can't be throwed. So I was always thought I was the cowboy that couldn't be throwed, and I was the cowboy that got thrown. So I finally found a horse too tough to ride there in uh, in the Los Angeles County. So uh, did you go back into the private sector? I, what control? I did there is, yes, I work uh, with CityGate and Associates. It's a consulting firm that does management audits uh, for like planning departments, other departments too, but my involvement. So and it, what it basically do is go into communities and look at their development services, their, de their planning departments, and how to um, make them more efficient, more productive. I really push customer service. You know, that's kind of my... Uh, what would you call that? Reputation over the years that 
that the, the concept I was associated with or pushed for was the idea that local governments ought to have a customer service orientation and, uh, and we ought to be more responsive and uh, more attentive to the meeting the needs of the people who live in our community and work in our community. So I'm able to apply that now uh, and I work in places like San Diego County and uh, uh, San Jose, in number probably uh, probably a dozen different cities that uh, in the last five or six years that I've worked in, uh, as a consultant to basically restructure, reorganize, eliminate some of their job descriptions, uh, put more of a customer orientation in their operations, and uh, learn how to listen to people. So let's go way back to the beginning of your career and okay. let's talk about AIP or ASPO. Were you a member? Uh, uh, yes, I was. I was a. When did um, you first learn about it, and how did you get involved? Oh gosh, uh, in Kansas City, when I first started out, uh, I worked with planners, and so I went to to planning meetings. They said, "Hey, you got to come to the. This is the organization," and so I joined AIP, uh, and uh, just became active in it, and. Over the years, uh, got more active and more active and more active. I saw it as a way to to reach out to the uh, to Im to improve the competence, the capability of planners. That that I saw it as a resource. And it, of course, I uh, haven't read the uh, talked to you earlier off tape here about the co the conference proceedings that APA used to AIP used to produce conference proceedings, and I would. Uh, uh, so I, I would read about that and I said, you know, this, this was educational. I learned an awful lot about when I read about planning in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s. Believe it or not, there are great similarities between the country then and now in terms of land use issues, uh, whether it's health issues, safety, traffic, schools, economic development. It's amazing. It's, it's, a, you know, it's the Solomon quote I referenced in about there's nothing new under the sun. Well, when it comes to planning in the last hundred years, whether it's the garden cities being applied in Orlando or those issues of, of traffic and health and safety issues, it's, it's still with us today. So I saw that profession that APA could help, uh, help make us better, more effective planners in terms of their publications, their outreach, their conferences. And I wanted to learn as much as I can. I did have the learning bug. And so I went to conferences and I, Early on, I paid to go to conferences, and then I learned that if you write and you have programs and you, you're on a panel or something, you can get, some cities will pay your, your registration fees. So I started doing that uh, as a way of getting to go to the conference, was getting on the conference, and then you, you learn so much. Uh, and then, Do you remember when you first got uh, full member AIP or AICP? Uh, AICP, I, re I remembered uh, it could be looked up easy enough because I was literally the last person to get the um, oral examination. Okay. Right now there's a written exam mm -hmm. and literally the, the, the panel that reviewed me, which Bob Wagner was on by the way, there's a name that hasn't come up before and uh, there, that's a name that has to come up. I don't think, I can't think of another person in the planning profession that did more to promote planning and advance the cause of planning and help people become better planners than Bob Wagner. Bob Wagner ought to have a statue built to himself and I don't know where we put it as, as vagabondish as planning is right now but I don't know where we put that but uh, Bob Wagner is that is that is the guy I idolize and Bob was on that panel and he and I passed that test and I got my AICP at that point Okay. Well, you also got involved in the organization in terms of being an officer or director. I did. Or, well, you, do you remember how that came I about? I just started at the section level. I became a section officer, and, and then I ran section? southmost section of the Texas chapter of the American Planning Association. Corpus. Okay. It would have been 74, 75, something like that. Okay. We, held a, we got the conference here in Corpus Christi. And then I got fortunate, we got the one, uh, when I moved to Galveston, we got the national conference there. My, probably the thing I'm proud of with the, my involvement was that I've always felt that the key was grassroots. And so our planning commissioners are incredible resources. And our planning commissioners just need the, the opportunity to be, become effective and influential. And we used to have a short course for planning commissioners. and so. I felt like the planning commissioners and the, and, the, and the planners should be together. We could have the, the short courses 
you know, in their own conference rooms. And but there was a benefit to having the planning commissioners and the 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 practitioners and. Uh, and that's another issue. I wish I had time to talk about that, that the academic community drifted away. When I first started in planning and went to conferences and the boards, 50% of the boards were academics. 21-member board, there would be 10 professors on there and there would be uh, four, two, three practitioners and then maybe seven or eight consultants. It was a, dominated by the professors, by the professors Secondly, by the consultants, and then by the practitioners. Right now, it's reversed, and, and the practitioners, which is the way I think it should be, is have. But it's too. It's just reversed now. It's too much that way. We've got to build bridges. So I spent all my years as APA when I was on the board, and in various capacities, trying to build these bridges, trying to bring people back to the profession. And we had to. We had to. They only, they only agreed to allow the short course to be in conjunction with the planning conference that we had if they were in separate facilities. So we held a short course, I think, on Corpus Christi Island, and then downtown we, we held the, the regular. And then we were able to shuttle and exchange, and then, then the practitioner said, oh, maybe that's okay. I mean, there was this real, here's planners that are supposedly change agents, and we were harder than anything to change. So we got them to come together. We did a, a, a notebook for them, a, short, a guide for planning commissioners. It was like 17 chapters, and we had I and some others. We wrote those chapters, and it was customized for the planning commissioners. And we gave it to them as part of the conference package. I love take-home value, let people get something valued. And then the following year, the chapter liked that so much, they said, hey, let's pay. And I think it was maybe Dr. Pugh, David Pew that in A and M that actually wrote the first professor, the real guide, unlike the uh, kind of bootstrap version that I and some some others did for us. Um, the other thing that I think had the most impact uh, on on my involvement here in Texas with the planning association is when we hosted the national conference in Dallas, and I was chapter president at, at that time. And so you actually get a role. The chapter presidents do play a role in the national conference and the budgeting and some other kinds of things. And we were, our compensation for participating uh, in return for all of our support, they gave us something like 50 free registrations to the, I can't remember the exact number, it was some number. Um, and back then, just like they are now, they're, they're expensive. They're like $400 or something like that. So, but so they parcel these out historically. They parceled them out, uh, and people got to go free. And in theory, their booth, their man encounters, etc. But what was happening was the, the people on boards, my opinion, were taking the free registrations, etc. And uh, so, what I suggested was that we sell our registrations. That any planning director that was going to the conference, instead of getting signing up nationally, buy our one of our free. 50 registration things. And so we sold our, a big, the bulk of ours to planning directors and around the state who were going to the conference. So it didn't cost our members anything. It gave us a ton of money. And when the conference closed and APA lost money like they usually do in their national conference, we had huge sums, like 40, 50, I don't remember how many thousands. We're an organization that had limped along on 5,000 bucks a year and all of a sudden, we had big dollars in the bank account. And that let us do all sorts of things. That let us be more aggressive on our programs, pay for things like the planning commissioner's notebooks, um, invest money in various training, short courses, other kinds of programs. It created a lot of money and gave the chapter the resources that we needed to provide outreach to the, to the membership and to provide the products and the services. And so I thought that changed the what we went from just being housekeepers of the profession to being challenged with how do we grow the profession? How do we grow the, how do we take this and get a return on our investment? We didn't, we did, uh, for example, we, we produced this subdivision regulation slideshow that we sold for about $150. And we could have given that, but we used the money to produce the slideshow 
And then we sold the slideshow to local governments to help their planning commissioners, and then that brought money back into the chapter that the chapter could use. And that's what I tried to push when I became national APA president, the same kind of thing, that we needed to be more entrepreneurial. We didn't need to figure out how to charge more for products. We need to do the Galveston technique. We need to figure out how to do more with less. One of the bizarre things that led me to want to get on the national board, somehow, because of my involvement with the chapters, I'm there at a budget hearing, and I, and we're at a conference in, or at a session, and they, they were talking budget, and, they, and someone says, well, there's 10, 10 issues there. How come this is this much money for the planning magazine? How come it isn't more? And they said, well, it's because we only produce 10 issues. Now, I'd been a member at that point, seven or eight years. I never knew we were only getting 10 issues. The magazines used to come so infrequently. Sometimes you'd get two of them, you know, in one week. And then sometimes we'd go like three months, we wouldn't get one. So I never knew. I just assumed, we, and so did everybody else at the time. We all thought we were getting 12. We were getting 10. And so we said, why are we only getting 10? Well, our staff that produces the magazine goes on vacation in the summertime, and we don't produce the magazine during that. So that's the kind of mindset that I saw that APA board that here was the number one mailbox service. This was our number one service that we got, this magazine, which I still get. This magazine is tangible proof that there's a profession out there, and there's all sorts of information that's useful in there for us. Case studies, uh, you know, over historical, uh, um, opinion pieces. It's just jam-packed. With, with, and I said, we need to increase the value of the mailbox services, the services that you actually delivered that, that touch people. We've got to put more resources there. And the things that we're spending money on, just like in Galveston, that don't see, don't want, don't value, but we've been doing them for 20 years, let's free up that money. Let's find those resources. Let's do this. Hey, for years I've pushed them to do a planning commissioner's journal. It's nuts. The stuff we ended up doing that in Texas. We ended up producing a planning commissioner's journal, just like the newsletter that we were producing. And we did we started doing an annual magazine. I forgot about that when we had that extra money. Once we got that extra money, we were then able to get each of the universities to do something for us to contribute, to produce a product, a tangible product that the individual members would have in their, in their possession that would enhance their ability to do their job. So that was the philosophy I took at the chapter level that I took up to the national level. Well, let's not leave the chapter yet. Uh, you were chapter president in the early 80s. Yes, I was. Do you remember some of the other members of the chapter board? At oh, the time? boy. The people that you worked with? Or? Uh, Paul Farmer and, uh, uh, oh, my gosh, this is embarrassing. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. Um, so... Then after you were chapter and Of course, president. Bob Wagner in those right. cases was on there, too. Uh, and David Pugh probably was involved. David Pugh was heavily involved. Um, so after you became chapter president, uh, were you elected to the national board, or did you go straight to run for APA I, I think after this, I, I went to, I, I ran for president. Okay. The, um, that was, I like to, this is going to be a broken record here. Boy, this sounds good. All these people keep liking Bruce here. But the chapter presidents talked to me. And because I was a kind of an outgoing <laughs> rabble rouser kind of kind of a guy, change agent. Hell no, we're not going to take this anymore. That was all those kind of things. Um, and so the chapter president said, "We're not getting the resources at the chapters. We're delivering services at the chapter level. We do a better job of delivering. It's almost like local government." Local government does a better job of delivering service than the federal government does trying to get it down to us. They said, we need the resources at the chapter level, and we need to be allowed to do these things and offer these products and services at the chapter level. We should be encouraged to do it. So I was the guy speaking like that, so they said, you're the guy that we want. So I was the chapter's champion, so to speak, and the only reason I got elected is because the chapter supported me. Uh, the chapters, they, back then there was a nomination process. The, the board created a committee and they appointed, they selected two people to run. You could run as a petition candidate. I actually ran as a petition candidate because the, and it's, you had to get petitions signed and a large number of them and they had to be from multiple states. And the chapters did that. The chapter president said, hey, we'll do that. We'll take, if you'll run, we'll do this for you. So that's behind why I became 
sorry. That's why I became, uh, uh, why, I became why, I got, why I got on the national board. And that was mid, late 80s the first time? Boy, probably right. And do you remember people that were on the national board when you were national president at that time? Mary Lou Henry. Okay. Who was, uh, um, yeah, should have a, should give me a heads up here. Okay. And, and the, uh, I'm never very good at names anyway, but as I've gotten older, I definitely am not. And, and you mentioned Is Stolman was the. Is Stolman was the executive director. Okay. Frank Ween, uh, Frank Ween was a California uh, chapter president. He was really the guy that pushed me. Between Jim Duncan in Florida and Frank Ween in California, they were chapter presidents. Those were the two folks that led this. It was almost just like national politics. You had two states like that pushing this. Floyd Lapp, I mean, all these names of people I could, they're, for the most part, they weren't Texas people. Mary Lou Henry was that rare exception. Mary Lou and Vernon Henry, who, by the way, are, are uh, there's another example. Of where if we're going to build a second statue, Mary Lou Henry would get that second statue uh, for her involvement and her role and what she's done over the years and did do for advancing planning and the merger. She was, she and her husband were major uh, players in that merging of APA and ASPO back then when that happened. Which, by the way, one of the things we did when I was chapter president here is we did merge. Uh, CPAT, which was the City Planners Association of Texas, which I happened to be the president of that. I was just an ego, power mad driven guy. So I'm CPAT president and I'm Texas chapter president. And we have these two organizations. They didn't fight each other, basically, but they didn't really work together with each other. They had nothing, nothing to do with each other. The CPAT tended to be West Texas, where I, where I grew up as a kid, brown, born in Brownwood, but I lived in Sweetwater and uh, Lubbock and um, so that Lubbock clan out there, where the where ASPA, where the CPAT felt like they, the National APA really wasn't doing much for them, and the Texas chapter was kind of the Texas chapter. Uh, but we had two pockets of resources there, and clearly putting them together uh, and sharing and building a relationship and accessing the resources that each one had and the expertise it had was the, the smart thing to do. And so I worked, and I thought since I was the president of both organizations at that time, there was no, hey, I'm, someone's gonna lose a presidency. So if, if, if Jim Bertram had, had merged with, a, with Texas chapter, then Jim's no longer a president saying, or he becomes the president of the Texas chapter, and there's now there's no longer a, whoever was Texas chapter. So this was the easy way to do it by Merging it when one person held both jobs, and I think, and and that was the tie to Texas Municipal League. And in Texas chapter of APA didn't have any ties to the Texas Municipal League. So by consolidating the two, the Texas chapter then became the entity that was that had a relationship with the Texas Municipal League. So it's just I, I overemphasize this, but that experience in Galveston, where just there's so much money wasted, and when you're in smaller communities that I worked in a lot of my life, early in life, when I worked at Bethany, Oklahoma, when I was going to OU, I was the city planner for Bethany. And when you don't have any resources, then you have to get help from the director of public works, from the city engineer, uh, from various departments. You get that in small governments, learn that you don't have, that you can't have a silo. It doesn't. You don't have the resources to have a silo. The worst thing in, in, that can happen is city gets big enough, a department gets big enough that they can have their own silos. You know, when the when the Los Angeles County, when the in the city of Los Angeles, when when they when they have a bigger planning department on their pub uh, their uh, public safety staff than the planning department has, that's a that's a boo boo. People, they, these departments, whether it's public works or whatever it was, they wall themselves off. If they can have their own planning staff, they can have their own accounting staff, their own HR staff. They become, you know, basically these silos that, and you then you lose all the assets and the resources. Planners are better when they have access to all the departments and when planners in all departments are talking to each other. When they're isolated like that, independent, you don't have the resources. You're not going to be effective. If, when it comes to permitting, that's the worst thing in creation because now you've got permits being handed off to different people over time. You can't, 
and every one, every time there's a delay kind of process. So you got to do away with the silos. You got to open up the process. You got to simplify it, streamline it. Uh, put people in charge. Assign permits to a case manager. Assign whatever it is to a case manager, and let that person be responsible and work through the systems. There's so much that can be done to make government more efficient, more effective, and that that. A lot of that is in uh, Tout Myself here, not my, my new book, CustomerService.gov, which you get on Amazon or at your local bookstore. And, is, and that was, it was mentioned to you earlier, which has now been translated into Arabic. There's something wrong when Saudi Arabia cares about more about customer service and government than we do. So, uh, <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll get to your books in a second. Uh, you do have a distinction, though, of being someone who has been elected national president twice. That, yeah, I'm the only dude that's, so, that did that. So how did that come about? Why did, why did you run the second time? Well, it was, I think it's the same thing that, you know, it, it had been a number of years. And um, i I give you an example. I, I'm obsessed with conference proceedings. And people should ought to be able to access what happens, be aware of it uh, at the national level without having to attend the national conference. I mean, it's what, what is it? 7% of our members get to go to the national conference. And it's a huge budget impact, and it's, a, and it's a very expensive undertaking. So, and I can still read what happened in the 1922 National Planning Conference because they had conference proceedings. So I was obsessed with doing conference proceedings. And I convinced APA to, to let me try. On my dollar, no expense of them, we would produce the conference proceedings. All I asked them to do was it's going to cost us it's about a four or five hundred page paperback oversized book. Was, this was done in the late 90s, I think it was. And it's, it's over. And all I asked that they budget it, budget it into the conference. So if the conference fee is $502, you add five dollars to it, you make it five hundred and seven dollars. So we did the conference proceedings. We turned it out two years in a row. Myself and another and a planner that worked for me in when we were in Orange County produced this proceedings. With hey, it was easy for us. The hard part of it was the people who were at the who were doing going to the conference, presenting papers or giving speeches. They had to give us a disc with their speech on it or with their. Um, paper if it was a paper and we gave them the format to give it to us on and we took the format and this guy that I was working with was a technology guru he slept on the machine edited put a little title box on the thing S small effort on our part very small effort we produced these proceedings we had a, the company shipped it to the national site the national site handed it out to the people we did that two years in a row the third year we did it on a disc we said why do the hard copy just give everybody a floppy disk on the thing. So now we're down to a dollar and a half to do this. That's all it was going to cost to do this. That was taken over by, I think, the University of Arizona, because we were just doing a demonstration to show it it could be done, because APA didn't have the staff, and they did not believe that members could edit a to produce a good quality product. So when they, uh, Arizona, for some reason, after one or two years, they quit doing that. I'm of the opinion today, I can't tell you 100% sure because I haven't been to a conference in five years, but I know I cannot order one online. I know I haven't seen one advertised. I know I don't see it when you register for the conference. So my guess is they didn't do this. But when they, it was this stuff that we started that when they didn't do it and they still weren't doing it and we were having issues with, uh, with back then it was Iz Stolman and Frank So, they would, and we were, still not responding to the chapters. It was fight, battle to the death. Um, and there was a little bit of conflict between AICP and APA at that point too. And the chapter said, we need to do this again. And so they came to me again on this thing. And so once again, uh, I, I ran for this national office. And uh, the one difference is that was a one-year term. The second time was a two-year term. That's something that, that you learn from the process. When you have a chapter presidency and you only serve in one year, or national president, that's, you, that doesn't do it. That'd be like one year mayor. You, you really can't do anything in one year. And the staff knew that. They'd, they would just hold their noses. And whoever got elected, they would just live with them for a year. And that second time when I came in, then we said, you know what, we're going we're gonna to go to an executive director now that's, that's a practicing planner, that has a, uh, uh, an orientation to the chapters, to the grassroots. 
and that was Paul Farmer. And so I think probably the one of the proudest things I've ever that I'm one of the things I'm most proud of is I was one of the people that got to vote for Paul Farmer to become our executive director. And I thought Paul did a super job for us having a someone with his years of experience and his knowledge and expertise actually is the executive director of this of our organization and all the efforts in his visibility in the profession going to chapter conferences and making speeches promoting APA uh, handling national press releases being interviewed by the Wall Street Journal or CBS it was great having a planner of, of stature that was respected in the profession there to represent us in the, in the, with the national media. So we've kind of alluded to your books and you've been a very, rather prolific writer. Yeah. Uh, are there any particular books or articles that my, particularly stand out? My, that you're proud the, of? There's two. My, my best book that I'm proud of, proudest of is The Planners on Planning, which uh, is basically 15 chapters by 15 different planning directors. People uh, uh, that were planning directors in small cities, medium cities, large cities, couple of academics in the bunch, women, Hispanics, um, African American. We got the entire array of these planners who when they were in elementary school, like I tell you, never voted for themselves and the idea of them writing something about themselves you know, was alien to them and I gave them the opportunity and, and charged them you know, with a responsibility, dead gummit, tell people why you got into the profession, what you accomplished, and what you thought, what worked and what didn't, what you thought made it possible for you to get things done. Write that about yourself and your history. And I got 15 cross section of the most respected planners in the country uh, to write those chapters for me. And I had the easy part. I wrote one small chapter for myself, and then I worked with, uh, uh, with Professor Catanese, Tony Catanese, to edit, to edit the stuff so that it, because you, you have to try to tie those chapters in together to, to make it. Um, and that, with that opportunity I had to shine the spotlight on those people who have made so much of a difference to the profession over the years. That uh, is, is one of my things I'm really proud of. And then I did this weird article in the journal of the, in JAPA uh, on, uh, the need for the planning profession to have a, a name and a brand identity, that we had to differentiate ourselves uh, in, among all the design professions, whether they're landscape architects or engineers. A lot of people do planning. A lot of people are in the planning profession. A lot of them who aren't planners are in. What is it that the American Planning Association, what is it that our planners do that is different and special, that is not done by other people who practice planning in an allied profession somewhere. And so I wrote that journal article and basically uh, I went back to the foundation, why, did, why do we have planning today? And it's uh, you go back to Chicago, you go back to the white city, you go back to the, the reason we exist as a profession is we need a plan for the city and the urban areas to grow and prosper, the sustainability. So that's what the profession does. That's what we do that's unique and different. We do comprehensive planning. We have a lot of people in the profession that do specialized things, whether it's economic development or urban design or land use regulations, but they all integrate into the comprehensive plan. They should, in theory, be integrated into the comprehensive plan. And while you're doing your one area of expertise, you need to also spend some of your time understanding your relationships to the other areas of expertise and how they all composite and come together. And then you call yourself a city planner or urban planner and that's what the urban that's what city planning is all about as a planning profession when I took the AICP exam the predominant thing I had to demonstrate to them was mastery and proficiency in the area of comprehensive planning that's what they were looking for and they wanted you had to to be a planner in charge you had to have done every one of these elements or been involved in the various elements, whether it was park and open space plan, the school facility plan, the utility system plan, the transportation system plan, that physical determinants of land use that I talked about earlier, the environmental suitability, sustainability. Where's the economic component? You know, where's the economic basis for the sustainability of this community that you're planning for and creating? 
All that has to fit together. So I wrote that article in the Journal of the American Planning Association, pushing that thing, trying the best I could to get people to understand this is not something to be feared. This doesn't diminish you. If you're the economic development specialist or you're the urban design specialist or whatever you're in, this does not diminish you that you're part of a bigger whole. This makes you greater that you are part of a bigger whole. But I had to do that because I understood that the reluctance of people to move out of their silo, their area of expertise, and to feel threatened if there's an implication that your area of expertise is not the be all end all on a thing. So I wrote that article and I got almost zero impact back from it. I don't see any movement, any part of the profession moving toward the recognition that what it is that made us special and unique, what was responsible for our creation, uh, and how we uh, are could prosper today is in that notion of the that we're physic that we have a a bigger physical planning responsibility that we all contribute to and create together and holistically. So those are the two that I think one thing made a difference: the planners on planning, because uh, I'm again they got their recognition, um, and more people talked to me about it over the years that they said, "Man, it was so great getting the." I'm, I have a book. I'm published. I'm there. I'm, I'm in the Library of Congress. So that was great. So thinking back on your career, can you identify a few major mentors that were particularly important to you, particularly in your Well, career? I mentioned uh, Ron Shard earlier. Paul Rice was a city manager in Bethany, Oklahoma. He was one of those great people I talked to, I told you about L.P. Quickingham. I cannot believe the, the, the managers. I'm, I'm drawing a blank on who the manager was in Lawrence, Kansas. Um, that he was also another famous, uh, famous city manager. But I wor literally worked for some of the most respected, well-known, well best-known uh, uh, you know, city managers in the country. How about planners in terms of mentoring you? I would say the, the Ron, again, of course, Ron Short, uh, Norm Stanifer, uh, I've, I've always appreciated uh, uh, his help. Uh, and of course the Jim Duncan. The Norm Stanford, I have to tell you a quick story on him. Uh, Norm, I was working for Bethany, Oklahoma as the city planner uh, when I was going to school at OU at the time and Bethany's population of 20,000. We belonged to the Regional Planning Commission there in Oklahoma City and Norm Stanford was the planning director of Oklahoma City. And so there I am with all these mayors, etc., and, and I was there representing Bethany, and here's Norman Staniford, Oklahoma City. Oh wow, you know, and, they, and it was it really admired and respected there for the students. I mean, they we knew who had gone out, of, gone to school there. When I I walked over and was going to introduce myself to him, he introduced himself to me. He took me under his arm, and he treated me like I was a long lost cousin or something. Uh, I cannot tell you what he did professionally in terms of the group that was there and when I would say something he would react to it back and and then uh, I knew him in Florida and we were involved in the Florida chapter activities etc so he was he was an incredible mentor the Jim Duncan I always considered Jim more of a friend than a mentor he boy if anybody doesn't know Jim Duncan then uh, they must have been buried under a rock or something because that guy is was so visible and so uh, so popular um, in uh, in the profession. The other side of that coin is protégés, people that maybe you have mentored that you're particularly proud of. You mentioned a few. Well, I mentioned the, the yeah, I've, I've rattled them, them off there. There was the Cheryl Cockrells or the Ray Quays, the Jesse Torres, um, you know, Emil Monsivais, the of uh, I'm surprised I remember all these names today. Here, this is this is good, <laughs> but there's. Um, there's, and then there's just a lot of people that that um, that I get calls from, you know, because I'll I'll every now and then I'll write something in the planning magazine. Something happens that it, it draws people's memory up, and people that uh, that I hadn't worked with for years will tell me good things. You know, that's why I don't want to share. But but it makes me feel good as a profession a professional. I had even in uh, Los Angeles County um, where I where I crashed and burned there, the Plan I had 200 people in that planning department staff, huge operation. Those folks, I had a great relationship with them. Boy, I had never worked in a place where I had better morale uh, in, that, in that city. It was, it was incredible. I mean, we, 
you'd think big sophisticated you know downtown Los Angeles what are we doing here I mean we were playing kickball and bowling and this kind of stuff it was amazing the relationship that I was trying to prove something in by going to Los Angeles County because that was the nutty thing I was close to retirement I was like two years from retirement I said why am I doing this but I really wanted to see if those principles that I learned in Bethany Oklahoma starting with nothing and nobody treating people with care and respect and providing them with the resources and the training your your co-workers uh, you know making yourself valuable to them not asking them to help you before you ask them to help um, pushing authority down to the local low levels at the whether it's at the counters or to people the citizens themselves I wanted to prove that works no matter how big of a city or how sophisticated it is that it's all the same that it can do it so so I uh, so I took that on that on that responsibility, and I in and to this day the, the bad news is I don't know exactly what happened to me in Los Angeles County. Um, I remember the the um, somebody that was a used to work for the FBI told me that if you want to know what happened to me in L.A. County, they said go see the movie Chinatown. <laughs> you know, and I said seriously, and they go seriously. So I was I was used to upsetting people in uh, in authority. Uh, you know, in uh, in rich people and well-off people, etc. So, so I, I kind of had thought I was a little bit bulletproof, to be honest with you, that you could do those kind of things. I think I found out that you can, you can reach a community where there are people that really do have clout that you don't know about, and they don't come up to you and tell you they're going to kill you or take, they're going to take you out professionally, uh, but they just do it. They just uh, don't brag about it, kind of thing. So. But I think the principles work. The principles, because they worked for two and a half years, despite losing a job. The, I, I think if you do those things, whether it's small city or large city or county, or you, it, it makes a difference. Planning can be effective. You had any advice for a young planner coming out of school? What might that be? Well, a couple of things I've, I've mentioned already here about make yourself valuable. Volunteer, volunteer for your local chapter. Uh, um, Volunteer to help other departments. Look for opportunities to, with your bosses, to say, "Hey, if there's if there's other departments that want to do some cross sharing, etc., try to expand your knowledge and expertise. You look, look, try to learn as much as you can about all the various functions in local government that are going on, and look for opportunities where you can help those people who may not be in your area, but also when you're in your own department, your own agency, however big it is." You know, try to make yourself useful and valuable to people. And education, you know, get your as much education as you can. Read those publications. If you ever get back to doing conference proceedings again, I, and I'm not going to run for APA again, <laughs> for the record here on the tape. That's out. Uh, but somebody needs to run that says, hey, uh, this is not for the 1%, this profession. The people, that, the 93% that don't go to the conference ought to have access. And in this day and age, for that thing not to be on the internet, what on earth is, is wrong with people? And it, it, this is another while off aside. It used to bug me that we'd pay $25,000 to hear Tom Brokaw or someone speak at our national conference. And they said, number one, we have national people with knowledge and expertise who would, pe who would speak for free. They'd be happy to do it. If you feel compelled to pay somebody something, great. Compel, compel yourself and pay them $5,000 or whatever it was. But to pay this kind of money to have, that, to say that we don't have people of stature and standing in our profession, that we don't have anybody that worthy of speaking at a national planning conference, what does that tell you about our, our own self-esteem of, of the profession? So that bugs me. Well, we've talked a lot about uh, our professional association. Are you involved in any other organizations that? Uh... Nope. I'm, I was. A I spent all my time in, in planning. When I had spare time, I, as I mentioned to you, I, w I went to a lot of little league and uh, high yeah. school and college baseball games. Well, let's talk about that. You want to talk about your family and talk about your sons? Oh, sure. Yeah, I've, I've talked about my wife. You know that I'm incredibly proud of her. What she's been able to to do with her education. I always introduce her and said she's a physicist in the family, so she has that degree in physics and, uh, and, the, and the master's in mathematics. And, and, uh, and she's a, she is very successful at what she does and 
uh, and she's had to be because when I change jobs, she has to start. She gives. I mean, she's been a professor and she's had um, tenure, and she's had to walk away from that so I could keep doing what I'm doing. And every place she goes, she she has to start from the lower level and work her way up again. And, and her name is Marie McClendon. Okay. And just out of curiosity, where did you all meet? At the Howard Needles Tavern in Bergendorf. Okay. She was a draftsman at that time, and I was that economic slash planner. Okay, and you've got three sons? Three sons. One's a planner in uh, Lake County, Florida. Mm -hmm. I think he's a planning director down there right now. <laughs> Whatever. When he tells me about these things, I said, I know Central Florida. That is a, a killer profession or killer location there. So uh, today I think he's, he's the planning director in, in uh, Lake County. Uh, I've got uh, another son who's a lawyer in California who um, works for um, Scott Boris, uh, which is a, if you're a baseball fan at all, he's kind of a devil. He represents the ball players. He's considered the uh, toughest, biggest, baddest uh, agent in the baseball market. And my son's his, it does the lawyer, does the uh, arbitration hearings and things for him, does the law work for that. And, uh, and then my uh, youngest son is now uh, going to be going to uh, school here at uh, at uh, Texas A&M Corpus Christi, he's. We think he's just finished his baseball career here. He's been playing in uh, minor leagues, major leagues, Australia, uh, Taiwan. Uh, he's uh, he's the only one in the family that's been to the Taiwanese World Series and the Australian World Series. And uh, I've got his jersey out here where he pitched for Team USA here a couple of years ago and something. Um, but uh, in my old, they, they played for Kansas City for. Milwaukee Brewers, uh, and where's the other team in there lurking around there? Oh, Atlanta Braves. Okay. All so, three of your sons. Uh, yeah, they were all professional baseball players. Okay. We've covered a lot of territory. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you no. want to talk about? I can't believe you haven't run out of, <laughs> if not tape, electronic, electrons. <laughs> Well, if not, that's a good place to end, and I want to thank you for your time. Hey, and I want to, want to thank you guys for doing this. Uh, this is... This is part, I'd like to think this is one of the things that we left that legacy of that, that cash hoard that we got courtesy of, of the National APA organization when they gave us those, those tickets. They gave us the resources to use, the, to access the resources that we have here. And by the way, fitting, fitting conclusion on that, they changed that. Uh, they had the, there's a number of McClendon rules at the national organization is, is after my term in office there. One of the McClendon rules is they, can't, they don't allow chapters to sell those free registrations <laughs> those uh, anymore. They stopped that the first year we pulled that. Well, and, and just an aside, I don't know if you remember the first time you and I met. Um, you were a chapter president. You were in Beaumont at the time. And I was getting involved in the environmental planning division at the national level. And we were trying to establish yeah. liaisons with yeah. chapters. So right. I gave you a call and yeah. said, you know, who, who would you like to be the chapter liaison with the National Environmental yep. Division? And your yep. response was, well, Dave, why don't you do it? <laughs> and for that matter, why don't you create a, a department for the chapter? And I mean, there were several chap uh, departments being yeah. created in the well, Texas chapter. See, that's the strength of this organization. It, your ideas, we created, I think we created the section, the, the departments here, before they created their sections at the, at the special, they're called sections, aren't they, at the national? Divisions. Divisions. I think we beat them to the punch. And we had, we had more of opportunities to do those things. But those ideas came from the grassroots. Believe me, national, the national you know, wasn't looking at how can we find, spend more resources uh, at the local levels? How can we give more um, obligations, responsibilities for us to, over, to have oversight of their operation? Who knows what they're going to do or when they're going to do it? So. We got it. You know, we have to look at what they're doing and how they do it. So, um, but it's it's people like yourself, Dave, that made this um, make this organization valuable. And look at the time you're you're having to do this. The fact that this program even exists and that your Brian is doing this and you're doing this. This is this is incredible. Okay. Well, again, well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, guys.